so what we're going to do today is uh, a few things. One is some nuts and bolts about the Plenary Council. What is it? How did it get called? When is it happening? Where is it happening? Who goes? All that sort of stuff. Um, and then the second thing that we're going to do is talk about the preparatory process from now until 2020. Uh, and then in particular, your role in that and how we will build the agenda uh, for the council itself. Uh, and then the last part will be um, how you can go forward from here today uh, and with what resources and to do what. Is that all right? If we cover those three things, is there anything else that anybody would like to uh, walk away with from today, from the next hour, hour and a half or so, a couple of hours, Where are we? hour and a half? Start with that. All right. Um, I'm very good at being cut off. So if you have questions or you want to make comments, just like um, get involved. Hi, Liam. <laughs> um, get involved and um, uh, just, you know, throw up an idea or, or make a comment. You're very welcome to. All right. So um, w uh, if I just start with what is a plenary council, is that okay? Um, so plenary just means all together, everyone all, all around. So plenary means all. And then council is the highest form of gathering that local churches can have in a particular place, all right? So it's, it's provided for in canon law. Canon law is the universal laws of our church, our Catholic church. Um, and uh, you can have different types of gatherings. So Catholics can get together in different ways. Locally, you would know that there's assemblies or synods in, in the Townsville Diocese, for example, right? So a council is a gathering of the local churches. So it's a gathering of the Diocese of Townsville, the Archdiocese of Brisbane, the Diocese of Sale and Sandhurst. Like when I say local churches, that's what I'm talking about. We have in Australia uh, 34 local churches. So we have 28 geographical territories, but we also have um, the, the Maronite diocese, the Ch Chaldeans, uh, the Melkites, the Ukrainians. We also have a uh, military ordinariate. So Catholic people who are serving in the military, there's a diocese and chaplains and priests for the military. And then we also have uh, Anglicans, Anglican people who are um, in communion with the Catholic church. And so there's a bishop for, for that. It's called an ordinariate. It's a sort of junior diocese, I guess. Um, so there's 34 of those in Australia. So when you say the highest form, like a, we're having to have a plenary council for all of the local churches and our particular place is our country of Australia. All right. This will be our fifth plenary council in history. The last one that we held was in 1937. So this is the, the well, certainly the only one in my lifetime. Anyone that's older than 80, maybe it's the second one in your life. But the 1937 one was attended by 32 people and 30 of them were bishops. The other two were priests, okay? Whereas this one will be attended by about 250 or so people. We're still working that out. Um, and it will be a mix of the bishops and priests, also heads of religious orders. So the Mercies and the Josephites and, you know, the religious, all of, there's 200 congregations that exist in Australia. We, we have to work with Catholic Religious Australia to sort of choose a number, so maybe 30 or 40 you know, heads of religious orders. And then also priests and laity, so men and women, right? And it's the first time that will happen. So we're very much, and 1937 was a very, very different time than Australia today. So we're very much in uncharted territories with how we're doing this. And, and we have to uh, understand and work within the construct of the canon law that provides for having a council. But we also have to interpret that broadly and go forward in a way that is responsive to who we are as Australia today. Does that make sense? So we're trying to juggle both those cards, I guess. Um, the Plenary Council for Australia will be held in two sessions. So I don't know if you know, but um, Pope Francis held a synod on the family, right? And he had two sessions. One, they were a year apart. So they got together for um, seven days of conversation first, dialogue. And that council session was actually preceded by surveys and input and whatever from families all around the world, yeah? So that first seven days, Archbishop Mark went there and he said it was a completely transformative experience because it was the first time he had heard a Pope say, I want to hear you disagree. I don't need to hear you say what you think I need to hear. I need you to just speak honestly. So that's where the phrase, speak boldly and listen with humble hearts. Pope Francis said that to them at that point. So we're trying to emulate that kind of a spirit in this process as well. 
So we're also going to copy the distance and time between the council sessions. So we're going to have two sessions for this Australian Plenary Council. The first one will be in October in 2020, and the second one will be in May around Pentecost in 2021. All right. The first session will be held in Adelaide, and the second session will be held probably in Sydney, although we haven't booked a venue yet. Yep. So um, that's probably it about the nuts and bolts. Now, the, the timeline for this happening and, and what some of the detail I've just given you, you can go back to and visit here around, so in the frequently asked, this is just the web page. So on the frequently asked question page is some of those answers. So what is a plenary council? Why are we having to that? Though I'll speak to that in a minute. When is it? Where is it? Blah, blah, blah. So you don't need to worry about remembering all of what I'm saying. Okay. Um, the timeline for preparation I'll come to, but it is also here. So it's in the read section. And it's a three year timeline of preparation. Okay. So we'll come to that in a minute. If I just speak first to why and what is the theme or the focus of this plenary council. So the bishops made the decision to have a plenary council at the end of 2016. And when they did that, when a, when a, a, a council can be called in two ways, either the local bishops can say, we want to have a council, or Rome can say, uh, please have a council, get your house in order, you need to get some things fixed, right? Which has happened to us a few times. Um, so when the bishops call the council, though, they need to seek permission from Rome, from the Holy See, from the Pope. And so they've, they've done that. And Pope Francis, we got a letter of permission in January. So it took a couple of years, or about 18 months or something. Um, and by doing that, what that's doing is the Holy Father saying to all of the people of God in Australia and the bishops, you have a maturity of faith and you have a maturity of church. That means you can take stock of where you are at and consider these things. Now, in order to seek permission, you need to provide um, an agenda. And Archbishop Mark went to Rome to say, the agenda is going to come from the people, so we don't have one to give you yet, right? But you need to say yes anyway, right? So they did that. And that, I mean, that is a great gift for us because the bishops have had enough courage to not call a plenary council about any particular item of t or topic that they think is important. They have called this plenary council to consider the future of the church in Australia. So by that, we're taking stock of, well, where is Australian society is at, is at? And what is the very role and relevance and participation of Catholic faith and Catholic community in Australian society today, right? So when, that's a pretty big thing to be considering. Would you agree? So when you do that, then, our job as a facilitation team was to try and um, dream up a process with a bunch of people who are quite smart at these things um, to try and make sure that uh, every person, like any age, uh, any gender, any connection to the Catholic Church, you might be a student in one of the Catholic schools, you might be a parent of a student, you know, you might be a teacher or a nurse in the hospital or a doctor in the, one of the Catholic hospitals, you might be a counsellor for Senecare, you might be somebody who comes to Mass five days a week, you know, or you might just be somebody who ticks Catholic on the census and has no other association or connection. So what kind of a process is going to be able to involve everybody, if, should they want to be? And then how can we go about inviting everybody? Yeah? So uh, that was where we started with our questions. But before I jump into then the process of preparation, I might just give you a few minutes at your table just to kind of digest those first ideas about what is a plenary council and why are we having one? Um, and then I'll take some questions after that. So have a chat at your table about your thoughts and your response, and uh, then I'll get some questions from you. Go ahead.
Okay, I'll just might interrupt you. You probably want to keep talking. What are some of the initial responses to that, some of that first information? It might not be the first time you've heard some of that, but if it is, that's okay. Lara, yes. I have a question. I just wondered, as I was listening to you, um, and I know that the first plenary council was in 1937, and it was top heavy with bishops and schools. Yep. And this is a very different time today, and, and the world is different. But I just wondered, did, did, did it achieve the result that they came up with? And I know that they would have set the agenda, but did people respond to that? And I just wondered if the outcome of that one. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So the question was, what you know, what happened at the 1937 Council? So that was the most recent one, um, which would have been the fourth, I guess, if this is going to be our fifth. Um, the, the decisions were appropriate for what was going on at that time. Um, they might seem inconsequential or small to us now, but they were things like um, uh, sort of a code of conduct for priests, really. Um, they were told, uh, there were decisions made like, you know, you, you need to not go to the movies after dark with uh, people and you need to not go to dance parties dressed inappropriately and things like some of the things were things like that um, one of the I mean which can seem quite amusing to us but in a time when you know there were like priests arriving as missionaries and you know trying to be reputable in the community at that time for 1937 expectations they were important um, the other thing that happened though was um, uh, and I'm still learning about this a little bit but they were provided a stipend which was important because many of them were um, becoming sick and malnourished and not able to actually do the ministry they were arriving in Australia to do. And they, because everybody was poor at the time, right? Um, not, I mean, many still are now, but you know. And so um, uh, they were dependent, as many new churches are around the world, they were dependent on donations of food for you know, sustenance and, and sort of gifts of the community. And so providing a, a small stipend for them to be able to have food and um, you know, rent a horse and things like that was, was really important. So that was, you know, it was less about the people and more about, more about their needs. correct, yeah. Now, the councils before that, I'm still learning about. Um, Peter Wilkinson is actually doing a series of um, papers that are going to track, because the first one was in 1844, I think. And so they're going to track the history of what those decisions were. So it'll be a great thing to learn, yeah, yep. Um, what I do know is that none of them uh, considered an open question like what is, what, how can we best be the Catholic Church in Australia? Nor did they focus, as I hear it, on the spiritual needs of the people. The <coughs> they might have prayed about that, but it, was, it wasn't an open dialogue with the people of the community, no. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question, thanks. Others, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. So do you have to be Catholic to be involved in this process? No, you do not. This is a process that has been designed very deliberately for all people to be able to enter into that is associated in some way with our Catholic institutions and operations. Um, so if I give you a very practical example, um, I do uh, uh, volunteer ministry at Matt Talbot in Sydney. It's a men's hostel, right? Um, and some of them may or may not be Catholic, but there's Catholic Mass on a Sunday morning, and some of them come just for the conversation after Mass. And they've got very strong opinions about the future of what the church should be doing in Australia and the contribution we should be making as Christian people. Um, and so the question to focus on, particularly for this first stage of dialogue, is what do you think God is asking of us in Australia? The question is not what issues are important to you about the Catholic Church, the question is not what teachings should the Catholic Church change? You know, they're not, it's not about the doctrine of the church. It's not about, um, it's not a question that is focused about issues. It is uh, a question that invites us to engage with God's kingdom, which the church, which Bishop Tim, you know, said at the beginning, God, um, the church is in service of, right? So the kind of the, the dream that we have for this amazing you know, society and, and in Jesus' land, you know, talked about as the kingdom of God or God's reign, you know, um, where 
nobody suffers from poverty, where there isn't injustice, where you know, all of those beatitudes come true, that's the kind of dreaming level that this is uh, inviting you into. And um, I mean, I'm an optimistic person, right? I am a dreamer, but I'm also a very pragmatic realist. And I know that the, um, the experience that some have now in our day to day and the change that they hope for, like there's a, there can be a big gap, right, between those things. But this first stage of listening and dialogue, which invites you to share stories of your very real experience today in response to the question of what do you think that God is asking of us in Australia, it gets you to a place where um, the issues come up, you know, like the, by sharing stories of my own personal experience, they bring up the things that are difficult for us. They bring up our sorrows and our hurts and the things that distance us from God by virtue of being engaged in or associated with whatever that attachment to the church is, you know. But they also bring up the joys and the hopes and the good things and the things that give life. So we'll experience that today when we do the listening and dialogue, but it's a really great question. And um, the one thing I do hope you go away with is the invitation for all people in Australia connected to or associated with the church in some way is very real, very genuine. And I must say, in going around the country doing this, it's the hardest thing for people to believe. I'm not Catholic, can I do this? Yes. You know, like we, we chatted, we were in Adelaide a little while ago and we chatted with a guy in the cafe, you know? So, I mean, he turned out to be Catholic, we didn't know that at the time, but you know, like it, it, it's, it's, there's so many people in our networks, like we are the church in so many different ways in Australia, you know, through our schools. Through, if you think about our social services network, you know, like I, I don't know the research, Catholic Care and Centre Care have done re good research on this, I think, but many of the, the people who do great Jesus work you know, are not Catholic. They might be Christian, they might not be, but they're in a Catholic agency. And so they've got a vested interest in being able to say, well, I really think this work is important and I think God is asking us to take it forward and do it better, you know? And so that kind of an invitation to reflection is, is very important and it is inclusive. Yep. Any other questions? Liam. Yeah, um, there's a few questions, but I'm assuming you're going to go into it at some point, like, like and you sort of asked, Yeah. Like, so, like, how does that happen? Yep. Um, and then I guess with only 250 people speak up to Adelaide and then Sydney or whatever. Yep. Like, I, I'm just doing the math in my head, you know, 30 to 40 bishops, yep. 30 to 40 bishops. Yep. So, like, there'll be 150, like, other priests and laity and then, you know, hierarchy and stuff. So, how do those, when, how do they sort of, like, keep those people and make sure that that's a representation of? Yeah. They're great questions, Liam. Thanks. So I've got, from all of that, I've got how does the people's voice actually create the agenda? What's the process? Who goes to the council? How are they chosen? Uh, how, how do we ensure they're representational? And is our voice, what did you say, Real, is our voice really heard at that level? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, out of tens, tens of thousands of responses. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next question is, um, who, are, who is the voice speaking to? You know, what if you say, do you want our voice to be heard? Who yeah. are we speaking? Who's doing the hearing? And what, how is it going to come back to us? Yep. Like, you can make a really nice document and illustrate it all those things. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, that's right. It's chapter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I like the phrasing of how does it come back into our hearts and actions. Yeah. Um, I've got to say that this process, the long three-year process, is based basically on having chapter, right? So there's a, lot of religious, there's a lot of religious sisters that have had their heads in this and I've said to them, you know, how do you do chapter and when has it worked well? So um, it, we've had a lot of learning from that wisdom and experience of, of the religious congregations, yeah. Um, Could you say something about something you learned from those conversations that you like over the past? Something I've learned from 
the religious sisters? Yeah. Like what, yeah. I think a couple of things. One is a plenary council is a decision-making forum, and the decisions become binding for all of the local churches in Australia. Okay. Now the decisions are in harmony with the universal teachings, right? So they're not. They're made by the 250. They're made by the 250 at the council. Yep. But they're only making decisions based on what the stories and topics and questions that are asked by the listening stage. So Liam, that speaks to your question. Um, so can I, can I give you something that gives you hope, right? <laughs> um, a story that gives you hope. Because I think that's a really valid point, right? Like many of us have been through a consultation process and then see no change at the end. Would that be fair? Yeah. Me included, by the way. Um, uh, so that's, that's one thing, that it's a decision-making forum and those decisions become binding for us. The other thing is that I don't know that in any consultation process I've been a part of, there has been, um, there has been for me, an idea that's already been created by a small group of people and that's what's being talked about. And so it turns into a, well, I like that bit, I don't like that bit, you know, um, I agree with this, I agree with that. That shouldn't go forward, that should go forward. So we're, we're hacking an idea that has already been created. Whereas this is an open invitation and you'll, it'll make more sense when we actually get to do the listening and dialogue thing together. Um, but this is an open invitation to speak freely from your life experience right now, from whatever is on your heart and your mind about your faith, our church, uh, and where God is asking us to go. And, um, and, I don't, and so it's messy because there isn't a clear idea of what that looks like yet. And it's messy because we are inviting people who have very different ways of answering that question to be in a space together and share stories of our experiences. So I don't know about you, but in society generally, not just the church, right, but it, it, I think it's extreme in the church as well, but in society, if I have a... Um, a few years of experience and I have a way of, you know, let's say, oh well, facilitating. So there's a world of adult education, right? So I have a way of facilitating that I very firmly believe in and I'll defend it to the hilt, right? Facilitators or speakers who do things in a very different way, I'm really critical of, you know? And I often don't go to their events, I don't go to their talks, I don't go to, you know, because I can't stand their methodology, right? Now this is, when you put that in a religious context and it's about personal faith or experience of church or very deeply personal life things like, you know, um, marrying my same-sex partner or, you know, making, being in a choice where poverty forces me to do something that is, you know, going to be judged or excluded or whatever. When it's that and not, it's not about a professional career, you know, it gets so much more difficult to even stand in the space of the other person. But this is a process that invites you to do that. To sit at a table, not to make decisions, not to defend um, your own perspective, simply to share stories. And I think um, our intention is that by the process of doing that over, if we can build a habit over the next 18 months of being in dialogue, sharing stories from our experience, then opening our hearts to listen deeply to the story of another. That way of doing business, if we put it like that, can be transformational in itself. So that here, in the Townsville community of people, you might bridge some you know, gaps that are currently fractured and divided because you create space to actually dialogue together. Um, and the third thing is that I think, well, things we've done in the past, some of it has worked, and we're trying to learn from all of the good of that, and some of it has failed, but if we don't try and make change happen, then like, we're resigned to things how they are. So I think probably they're the things that, three things that, that make it different than we've done stuff we've done in the past. Um, who goes to the council, okay? So who are the 250 people? Liam's right, if you add up the numbers, right? So we have to work within the construct of what canon law says is quorum for having a council, this significant universal church event which can make decisions for all of the churches in Australia, right? 
So we have to uh, work within those constructs, but there's a lot of room in those constructs to interpret and widely uh, you know, make real. For example, uh, there were 32 people in attendance and, and 30 were bishops and two were priests. So no laity, whereas in where canon law provides for laity to come, right? So this time, we're making sure they do. Um, so if you add up uh, the bishops, the vicar generals, the episcopal vicars, uh, as well as then the um, heads of uh, seminaries, right? There's about seven of those. Um, the heads of Catholic tertiary institutions, so like ACU, Notre Dame, uh, Yarra Theological Union, the places that teach theology around the country, the heads of those, um, a couple of whom are female, um, a couple of whom are lay people, and then also um, heads of religious orders. So if you add up, if you sort of have about, in canon law, the numbers of heads of religious orders and the numbers of heads of seminaries are to be decided, right? So that's a conversation that's only just begun between CRA and the bishops, about how many. But let's say we land up with around 40 heads of religious orders um, and, um, uh, yeah, and then you add up all that category, that lands up around 160 or 170 people, okay? Now the catch in canon law is that the priests and laity, so those who may be invited, um, uh, can only be half as no number of that, right? So if it's 160 or 170, we land up with about 80 or 85 priests and laity, right? Which means uh, if you then do things like understand all of the diversity of people, so men and women split, you know, the gender split balance, um, and then all of the ethnic and migrant communities that are throughout Australia, the various Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, younger people, older people, people from health, people from education, social services, like if you list all of the diversity you can think of, people with disabilities, people sleeping rough on the street who are receiving ministry from the Catholic Church, um, uh, whatever, like all of the diversity you can think of, we're not gonna fit it in. Like you could put one person from each of those diversity categories and you would land up with 500 people, I think, you know? So the council cannot be the point of this. The council is a, is a moment in the journey, a very special moment, but the point is the, 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 the two years, the 24 months beforehand. And we are provide, there, there are moments in that year of the council that will be key um, council agenda dialogue moments for that category of people as well, to expand who can be in this, right? So for example, in 2020, the National Catholic Education Commission will be having their five-year congress, right? So there'll be a couple of thousand Catholic people involved with Catholic education, you know, um, as, and they'll be discussing the council agenda, right? There'll be a time and session for that. There is um, the Proclaim Conference. So people from parish and leaders like connected to Catholic, like lay movements and, and parish-based stuff will be uh, discussing the council agenda. The young people gather for um, the Australian Catholic Youth Festival in December 2019. So it'll be a major forum for young people to be doing the council agenda, right? So all of these things will be prelim steps to that six days of the 250 people. So I, I don't know if that is clear for you, but that's sort of how we're going. Um, how they get chosen is we're going to invite, so we're going through this first stage of listening and dialogue. All of that is gonna then come together in a consolidation period, I'll speak to that in a minute. But at that point, about mid next year, we're gonna invite communities to nominate uh, people to be delegates at the council. And we'll have, you know, all of the diverse, we'll, have, we'll make it available public. You know, this is all the diversity we're looking for. So if you know somebody like this, then get together as a community and, and you know, put this person forward. And then from all the nominations we receive, there'll be a, a panel of people, men and women, younger and older, um, in, from a couple of parts of the church. And as a facilitation team, we'll guide that panel. Um, and they will uh, be selecting from those nominations because I imagine we'll receive more nominations than spots, you know? Um, so that's, that's sort of, we'll try and make that as open as possible, you know? Um, it won't be a tap on the shoulder, you're it kind of thing. And it won't be a, I've got this position so I deserve a spot, yeah? Um, the other, that same process of inviting nominations to be delegates, also we will invite nominations to be part of working groups, which is the second stage for next year. Okay, so I'll come back to that. How will our voice really be heard? In a couple of very practical ways, 
every single response that comes in online or by post, I've received a couple of those, um, or an audio recording or a piece of artwork, every single response is read by three people, right? Me, uh, Trudy Dantas at the Pastoral Research Officer and Peter Gates, who's also on my facilitation team, all right? Now, that means that we're, every week we download everybody's responses and we sit together and we read them. In addition, to, so that's, that, that's the identified responses, right? Like, we, if we take out the, the identifying data and have the stories and the topics and the questions that are being asked, then that is for um, uh, a wider group. So there's a consult, there's an, I've got an advisory team, 15 or 16 men and women. There's working groups in your local diocese, right? As well as that, the council delegates. So the, the stories that are, being written, that are going to be written down, the questions that you are going to ask, and this will make much more sense when we do the activity, um, the questions that you're going to ask, they directly build the council agenda. So if something is not talked about, or you don't ask questions about something in particular, then it's got no chance, no hope of making it to, this, to the council agenda. Does that make sense? Is there any questions, other comments? Yeah. So it's just getting started. Um, Jeff, who you started at the beginning, he's relatively new in the diocese, right? Um, so he and Neil are beginning off. Neil, do you want to give any other thoughts to that? Yeah. Everybody. So if people want to be involved or contribute to the centralised working group from the diocese, you can get in touch with Neil or, or, um, or Jeff. Um, but really, what we have designed this to be uh, locally activated. So at its core, you can sit around your dinner table at home and your voice is directly shared with the Plenary Council team. Okay? So I'm going to walk you through that now, um, which speaks to then the question that I think you asked about who, who does the hearing. right? So we are invited to, um, at this first stage, the hearing is done by each other as much as it is done by the Plenary Council team. And that's the habit that we're trying to create, right? Trying to recapture. So this is a, it's a four-step dialogue process. It's based on a model of, called contemplative dialogue, if you care to know that interest, um, little point. Um, contemplative dialogue basically, I mean, it has a whole bunch of facets to it, but the core of it is that First, before we speak, we take a minute to reflect, or two. So it really invites, trying to invite spirit and God into, you know, what we're speaking about and how we're sharing. So um, the four steps are to, you're invited as a small group. So it's a designed as a, a small group activity, right? So a group of four or six people just kind of sitting together and talking together. Um, so you're invited to pray together. The second step is that you're invited to Reflect on the core question around what do you think God's asking of us in Australia? And then you're invited to choose a topic from everything that you might have responded to and share stories from your experience. Now that story sharing is really me the meat of the dialogue encounter. It asks you to say something to your group mates about your personal lived experience, right? 
related to the topic you've chosen as a group to talk about. And then the last step is to pray and then do your response together, your response online. So um, if I just walk through each of those steps. So you're invited to, like it's top and tail by prayer, right? That's because we really hope that God's in, I mean, I believe firmly, but we're really trying to introduce that God's in this with us. And some people, like we've done this with a group of atheist people, and so they, they didn't, they read the invitation to prayer, but they were like, oh, we don't pray. And I was like, that's okay. And then one of the group members said, well, we could just talk about God. So they did. They talked about their various understandings of the God concept, right? So they, like I, which I thought was a fantastic conversation. So, but then I'm with other young people in the Maronite group and they were all just sort of, you know, speaking deeply from the heart, you know, in their prayer experience at the beginning. So no matter where you are at with your relationship with God, the invitation to prayer is what's important. How you pray is not. So there's a few options here. So you might like to read scripture if that's what you want to do. You can read the words below here, which is the plenary council prayer. Or you can just speak to God from your heart if that's what you want to do too, okay? So that invitation is there together. So as a small group, that's your first step. The second step, if we flip over the page, is to read this question and reflect. So again, before we speak or before we, you know, engage with each other, we're just invited to a little bit of silence. And if you're in a small group and you're in a cafe or whatever, it can feel a bit weird maybe, but this moment of silence before we speak is pretty important. It lets things bubble up in us, you know? So as you sit and reflect in silence on this question of what do you think that God is asking of us in Australia at this time, we've put some pen and paper just on, on your tables, just blank page of paper. You might like to jot down a whole bunch of notes that you, that, of things that come to mind. Um, when you've had a bit of time to do that in silence as a small group, then uh, you're invited to just share those lists with each other. So not to defend them or explain them really, just to sort of share with your group mates the, the list of things that you've written that you might like to, you think God is asking of us. So that's gonna be lots of different things, isn't it? All right, so what are some things that immediately come to mind for you like that? What do you think God's asking of us? Sorry? Humility, so being asked to be humble. And that can be unpacked in all sorts of ways, can't it? What else? Learning to love, Learning to love each other a bit better. Yep. The equality, yeah? So learning to be, uh, find equality, create equality, yeah? Um, one of the youth groups I d have done this exercise with, they said, well, I think God's asking us to fix homelessness. Why can't we? You know? So big things, right? So all of the things that come to mind in that question, and as you continue over between now and Ash Wednesday to reflect on these questions, more and more things will come to mind. So this is a not a one-off process. This is a process that hopefully you'll experience a number of times over um, with different people in different settings, you know? Now, once you've shared those lists to each other, you then as a group choose one theme to talk about. Now, it can be one, if there's four of you in the group and you've all shared very different things, it, that one theme might just emerge, you know? You might go, oh, okay, we're just, just gonna, we seem to all have elements of leadership, so let's, let's choose that one together. So as a group, you just choose that one topic and then write it down here. It just helps you keep focused, okay, as a little group. With that one theme, let's say it's leadership, then you move to step three. So you're invited to reflect on well, in this area of leadership, what has been my experience of my faith? What has been ex my experience of leadership in the church that I have experienced? So if I'm in a school, what's been my experience of leadership? If I'm in a religious order, if I'm just in society, what's been my experiences of leadership? And think through, reflect on those experiences, okay? Again, these are not new behaviours. We're just creating time and space to do it in a particular way. So then once you've had some moments to think about and reflect on your experiences in this area, then you're invited to share those stories with each other. So it's really good in your groups if you can be like kind of, you know, sitting with each other in a small group with nothing between you. I know it can be a little bit confronting, but it really actually makes the experience quite powerful. But it doesn't matter how you are, you know, you can be around a table, you can be at a pub, you can be whatever, you know. Um, but that sharing of those stories is the crux of this. And there's stories like, um, 
for me, like I was in a little group when we early on in March when we were trialling this, and the topic that our group chose was music. And one of the, like music is transformational for me. You know, I can hear music and it makes me feel emotion in ways that nothing else can. Um, and so I was sharing a story about how when I first went back to church after 10 years of not going to church, uh, I liked the band, so I went back, you know. And then it had this whole transformational, you know, journey. So that was my sharing. It's not so much about I hate the music at church and I think the ladies should be blah, blah, blah. Like try not to go into, you know, try not to go into solving a problem. And it's very hard. You have to catch yourself. Try and think about, well, what's my experience in this? How does it make me feel? What has it made me do? You know, in the area of leadership, it can be about a good boss or a bad boss or, a, you know, like a, a great example of when I've displayed leadership and the things that transformed in me because of that. It can be a crappy experience of when leadership was abused and bad things happened as a result of that. Whatever it is, but try to tap into the emotion of that experience stuff. Once everybody, and also the other thing is when one person is sharing, if you're anything like me, I go, yeah, 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 I think so too and want to add my point, right? Try not to do that. So we're going to, like contemplative dialogue means listening deeply to the story of another. So if you're anything like me, just sit on your hands. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> um, some people are quite comfortable to just say yes, you know, and stay quiet, but not all of us are. So just check yourself when you're doing that. When everybody has shared in your story, the last part of this step four, this story sharing element, you're not invited to critique each other's stories. You don't need to say, well, how are we going to solve those problems? It's not a problem solving exercise. You don't have to um, uh, vehemently disagree or defend your point of view from another's. You know? What you're asked to do in this final step is actually just take a minute to say, well, actually, how have the stories of those other people that have shared with me affected me? What's going on in here? and share that with your comrades, with your group mates. So that looks like something like, you know, Liam, thanks very much for sharing your story with me. It's really challenged me because they're not the worldviews that I have, but I actually am really grateful for you taking the time for that, so thanks very much. Or, um, you know, uh, Jack, that story was incredible and I feel really inspired. Thank you so much for sharing that. Or, you know, whatever it is, it's just a moment of acknowledging you have really heard their story and you've let that in a little bit. Now, when you're with people that are like-minded, that can be really easy, I think, that experience, you know? When you're with people who have really different opinions or perspectives than you, then if you're anything like me, like sometimes I sit in the circle and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about, you know? So just be conscious of that voice and sort of say, am I judging or am I listening? Am I taking this in and letting it affect me? Am I trying to stand in their shoes and understand, you know, where they're coming from? the life experience that they've had to get them, you know, to, to the point where they're at, right? Which is really hard, I think. Um, and you don't have to agree or disagree, that's the great thing, right? Just let it in. Because the result of doing that, that story swapping is relationship. You can no longer not know that person, you know? You can no longer demonise them when you're in the kitchen saying, oh God, blah, 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 you know? So it, it in increases our our beautiful Jesus behaviours, if you like, if we do this well and we really commit to listening to the stories. So that last step then is a, is a moment as a group of prayer together. And it's just a simple gratitude prayer. So step four in, in yellow over the page. It's a simple gratitude prayer that's there. Or you can just say, thanks, thanks God and thanks to you for you know, being a part of this. Like it, in your own words is fine. But there's some words there to make it easy if you want to. The last part of step four then is the response. And the response um, eventually at some point needs to come to us online, uh, you know, into the, into the database of, of responses. But that can happen in any number of ways. The point is the dialogue. That's the culture changing element, you know? So if you're with, let's say, a group of friends at a cafe or a group of mates at a pub or in a workplace at a staff meeting, right? Let's take those three examples. At a cafe, if you're with a group of friends, then in this last, after the dialogue, in this last moment, you can sit together as a group of four or five people and actually type in your responses online together, yeah? Somebody can do it on their phone or somebody can just type into a Word document and upload it later, right? If you're in a staff meeting, you can actually in, have a couple of people with the role of listener. So they're capturing things that are being talked about. Um, in, a, in a group at a pub, you may decide not to and you go away as individuals and you go home and you do your response online. 
just as individuals, that's perfectly okay. You may be at a school community night, so the principal might host and invite parents in, students in, people from the parish, you know, business people, and host a listening and dialogue session as an event, right? Which is not the, the drive of this, but it just, it might be something great to happen. In that way, you can have, like Neil and, and Jeff can help out and say, you know, let's have a couple of listeners for that night, you know, or for that evening or whatever it is. Or teachers, you know, could take a particular role in that. So it doesn't matter how it comes in. The other thing is for pre-literate and illiterate people, like voice recording on a phone is just as good. Um, you know, just someone, like for example, with the Matt Talbot guys, the person who does the ministry is going to take care of writing down their responses. Okay, so as a, as a group of people in the diocese, that power is completely in your hands. Okay, you don't have to wait for something to be arranged or an event to be called. This is the invitation. So that power is in your hands. Is that okay? Is there any questions about that? I'm just going to show you it online so you know what it looks like and then I'm going to hand over the time to you. So on the web page, when you're at home, Oh, actually, I just want to show you something. This little button over here is a disability enabler. Like, it's for people with disabilities. So, um, it makes the web page easier to use for those who have either vision impairment or hearing impairment or color blind sort of stuff. So, that, that's in there. It's a little box up there. Um, I would encourage you all to subscribe to the newsletter. <laughs> Promo. Okay. Uh, have your say, respond online, all right? So we're in resources, but also when you're actually in the web page and not just on the landing page. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, purple. There's a little button up here, quick, quick button that says have your say, okay? So have your say, respond online. So this listening and dialogue encounter is exactly the invitation or the words, you know, that I've said out loud. It's written down here so you can... Go and experience it all again if you wish. <laughs> um, this question about how can all people be involved is that four-step process of download this listening and dialogue guide, get some people together, pray, talk and listen to each other using these steps and then send your responses in. Okay? These sheets that you have are these links here and there's one particularly designed by teenagers for young people. So there's some 15 and 16 year olds got a hold of this one and they said we're going to make it better for us, so they did that. It's the same process, but it's in their language. Then the online response is here. So have your say, submit your response, click here. So it's a big blue button. And it takes you to the response where there's a few questions before this about am I a robot and how old am I? Um, but you can see the questions here. So what do you think God is asking of us in Australia at this time? Okay. So that comes from your dialogue. That's that first stage of step two in your, in your reflection. Um, this question here is not in your dialogue directly, but it asks you to think about your dialogue in answering it. So what questions do you have about the future of the church in Australia that you would like the Plenary Council to consider? So it's a more direct question, okay? The reason it's only in the online part and it's not a part of your dialogue is because the, the way of being together and trying to talk to each other is, is what, we want you to you know, what we want people to focus on. So this question here is for the response afterwards. After you've had that reflective dialogue experience, then to think about, well, actually, what questions do I want the council to be considering? If it's about the future of the church, what do I want you know, us to be focused on? So people have written great questions in here, so go for it. And then this one is, is related to the story sharing part. So would you like to share your story with, with, the, with the team? And, uh, and people have been writing their stories in here. And those stories weave the tapestry of all of these. Like people ask questions and they've you know, put forward their critiques and things that they want to be changed. But the stories of experience are just what help um, understand the perspective. So they're really powerful. Um, at the end of this online survey part, you can also then attach documents. So you can attach PDFs attach MP4s, um, you know, Word documents, all of those sorts of things. Um, and you can also then, right before you submit, you can, download it, you can download a copy for yourself. So you can keep a copy for yourself on email, okay? Without having to put in your email. You need to you just download it on the spot. Is that all right? Okay. Is that anonymous or 
Yeah. So it can be anonymous and you can put your name in. So if you don't want to put your name in, you can just click next and go past it. If you want to put your name in, then you're invited to. Yeah. The only thing that you're asked to do that's mandatory is your postcode. That's it. And that's only so we can give the feedback back to each diocese. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is invite you to, in your small groups at your table, actually do these steps one and two and three together. So you're going to read the, you know, do a little bit of prayer together. You can read the prayer or you can just talk to God from your heart. And then take a few minutes in silence to just reflect on this question. And during that silent time, you might want to write some notes, which you've got some paper there for. Try to respect the silence of the others. So just sort of make eye contact with each other and sort of, when you're ready, say you're ready, you know, and then start talking. Okay? All right, over to you. Oh, sorry, it's quarter past three. So to go through these four steps, we'll, normally we would give you about 45, 50 minutes, but can I just ask you to speed it up a little today because it's supposed to be a test, right? Um, maybe half an hour, would that be okay? So we'll go till, uh, actually, a little bit less than that. Can we go till 20 to four? And then we'll use the last 20 minutes for actually hearing what you talked about. Okay? So until 3.40 and just work your way through the steps.
just got a few minutes left. So wherever you're at in the process, that's okay. Um, but if you could just use the last few minutes to uh, finalize your chats and maybe say a quick prayer together. So how was that experience for you?
Fun. Did you say fun? Oh, that's a good response. Yep. So, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah, that's right. So, Sarah was saying um, uh, she's excited about the flexibility, is that right? Of where it can be used? Yeah. Um, uh, did anyone else have that experience? Like maybe this can, you know, ideas pop into your head of this can be used in this place or that place? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What, how else did you feel doing that process, having that experience? Was anyone uncomfortable? Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, in the silence, yeah. Yeah, you do, yeah. <laughs> That's why it's good to have a mix of different people. I do think like silence is uncomfortable for some and very comfortable for others. So that's a that's not such a bad thing. It's a great, you know, it's a good thing. But yes, having diversity in your group means that somebody will eventually bump you out of the silence. I would be that person probably. Come on, let's talk. <laughs> we found that sometimes very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> to stick to the steps. To stick to the yeah. Steps. Not start making comments and having like directing or yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, and I think it's facilitating people. Yeah. To sort of have them do it like that. Yeah. Would be quite challenging. Yeah. It definitely is a, it's a learned habit. Yeah. Um, my experience has been uh, when the group comes together for the first time, often the majority of the time is spent just at step two. And everybody starts going round and round on all the different issues of what we think God's asking of us in Australia. Um, but then, eventually, someone steps in and goes, oh, what are we supposed to be doing next? But then the time's run out. So, in my experience, other groups that have done that have said, oh, well, let's pick one and we'll come back together next week and talk about that. So, the, that's a very good point. Keeping the steps is a challenging point, but, um, uh, you know, it doesn't need very much facilitation. It just sort of needs a little gentle process holder. So, yeah, thanks. It's a great point, Judy. Others? Yeah, great. Um, we didn't actually um, name, you know, really specifically the topic. Yeah. We just picked what we generally mapped in our initial. Oh, great. Topic. Yeah. And it seemed to just naturally then flow into the standards. Great. You know? Yeah. So okay. So then we went back to the DM and kind of said, what would it be the introduction? Yeah. Sort of oh, good. What did it land up being? Yeah, right. Yep, the other. Yeah. The other. Yeah. Yep. Whoever's not my, like, not like me. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Others from this side of the room? No, I'll just come back up. I've got that six day, four days intensive. And it was slow? Yeah. And yeah. the first day thinking maybe that could have been done in two hours. Yeah. That's <laughs> the end of it. Um, and it then frustrates me now. If I'm sitting in a process which I think really should be a day, yeah. um, I'd love to spend a day with these four people. Yeah. Discussing these things yeah. and walking and talking and being yeah. part of the... I think we're, we're going to have to give this time where this is going to get very yep. surfacey sort of... So the point... What's your name? Roby, what the point Roby's making is, is good dialogue, deep dialogue, needs time and space. And um, the point of today is not really to give it that depth of time and space that it's needed. The point of today was to make sure you're equipped with knowing about the Plenary Council, knowing your, your role in it. But what I would say is that if you do want to spend a day, the four of you getting back together, go and do it. Because now, this, how this happens is completely in your hands, right? So you don't need me to come and do things like this. You can, like if you've got people around you 
and you want to have a dialogue experience with people, you can play the videos that are, that are on YouTube for everybody to access. And you can say, look, I, I really think your voice is important. Can we, can we do this together? You know? um, we didn't want a process that needed events to be held in order for people to share their voice. Um, the minute that we were going down that track, uh, we were in trouble because there's one of me, I'm the only one full-time employed, right? Peter and Noel are part-time, they're about a day a week, you know? All of you are busy people, but there is time for you to be able to get those around you, you know, and, and create that time and space locally in all sorts of different ways. So that is a really good point, and I hope that you actually decide that this does need time and space and you can create it, you know? Um, I had a chat with um, Auntie da Gladys, thank you, in the session this morning, and she said exactly the same thing. So she said, I can take this back to my people, but this will need a couple of weeks. <laughs> and I said, okay, go for it, you know? So that, that's the intent of this, so it's a really good point, I think. Other feelings or responses to the experience? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's great. We were four people who hadn't worked together before. Yeah. And, um, and then we found the process good, actually. We, we, we were quiet, we played, and we were quiet, and we wrote. I think we, we, we share that sentiment, do we? Yeah, yeah. So what I would like to hear now is actually what you talked about. And then as you share that, that will become a submission from today. So I'll, I'll take a photo, you know, I'll write on the board and, and take a photo and we'll load that in today. Yeah, go for it, Judy. As this stands, we've had a process recently where we, the online is dialogue Yeah, right. And I thought it's like in our dialogue, maybe there's a possibility of, you know, creating a little group on an online Yeah. Somebody in air said that yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, as long as the, the online element has that relational aspect, you know, like you, you sort of don't want to land up in a tax zone, yeah. But um, somebody online, somebody yesterday said um, even a webcast, you know, where people were vi like video chatted in or something like that. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. So all of those sorts of ideas, go for it. Like you can, you know, from your own pages, you can say, okay, I'm going to put this on at eight o'clock on Thursday night, you know, anyone want to join in, come along. So you, you go for it, that's a great idea. So, what did you talk about? What were some of the things that came up? Yeah, go for it. Um, oh, look, I've said that the, um, I've started with the, if the church is a vehicle to get to God, then it's not a lot of people on the bus at the moment. Yeah. But I do feel that the good news story is in our schools, in our hospitals, our aged care, our social work teams, our like, orange line orders, you know, service the homeless. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Developing unity, is that what you said? Yep. Yeah, what did you say about justice? Be more just, Be more just. yeah? And did you talk about how? Um, tolerance, acceptance, yep. compassion, and caring for the environment, and the Okay, others, thank you very much. That sounds like wonderful dialogue. Yeah, thank you. Others, what did you talk about? Come on. <laughs> You're all having such great dialogue. We talked about being the gift to people. 
Yep. Okay. So it's shut down a little bit. So using the gifts and not shut, not, not, what did you say? Uh, not, being encouraged. not being encouraged to use them. Ah, okay. Called forth from others. Can you explain that a little bit, Judy? Well, sometimes somebody can see something that you're really doing. Yep. Ah. Uh, like yep. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, great. So saying you're a lovely, welcoming person, can you do blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Other stuff? We added to that, Sister Catherine talked about the gifts we get, have each day. Like the gift of everything, weren't you saying, you know? Well, I was just saying that I was thinking, you know, it's like anything that I have has been gifted to me. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Ah, oh, okay. So I'm just going to write that down verbatim. So anything I have is gift from God through others. Example, say that again, Sister Catherine. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Say that again, being able to contribute as church, as the church? Yeah, yeah. So, like, as individuals, as our, we can be able to Ah, okay. So, are we being asked to do that? Yeah. yeah, yep. And you're saying yes. Yeah, yeah, how are we doing it? Yep, okay, great, thank you very much. Any others? Yep. Can you give an example about that? Well, for example, if, if how suspicious is a very good example because we have ready sources for for helping us to get a wider view of what's going on in the world and the development needs and all that. But to add to the ethical Yep. So there's blockers to the good stories being able to be shared. Okay. Yep. Is that about being... There are blocks to what being a community. Communicating. Okay. To communicating. Okay, great. 
Yep. So how do we do that? How do we get through those blocks and communicate the richness of the church's life? Okay. Thank you. Others? Yeah. So I guess like the discussion is around inward in the church and the structures and, and kind of there's a number of us that have come across barriers and attempts to kind of not being inclusive, not being supportive. So like we talked about that and like, you know, even like a, a male white person, but young. Yeah. Yep. See the other. Um, when you say, um, how do we see the other ha and, and the challenges for us? Do you mean each person individual? Do you mean the church yeah, institutionally? I mean individually. Okay. Um, because, well, because, you know, it's individual. It's in the sense of who's in the family and Yeah. And we could include and support and, and it takes away that it can only be I or yeah. and make it into both or I think that's what I think I mean. Yeah. Like really listening and accepting and hearing the other and understanding the why is much better and more and we have the richness that everybody has access to. Because you know Correct. To get to that, to yeah. Or we can feel what's in our heart or what's in our head at the moment, but we think God's just doing that. So how do we dig deeper? Yep. And we end up, you know, like maybe we, God's asking us just to pay attention. No. Oh.
I think these um, are really wonderful dialogues that you've obviously just experienced in just a short time. Um, this process is designed to be repetitive um, and to be able to give time and space to deepening the dialogue because the first time you come together to experience something like this, all of this bubbles up, right? Because I, I don't think we give enough time or space for this kind of um, dialogue in this way. Um, uh, but also, I think as you come together, not only do you learn the habit better and keep the discipline better ab about these four little steps, or adapt the four steps if you want to, if that's something you want to do, um, but also it means, you, you, so you develop the discipline, but you also go deeper. Because you, you, you talked about that last week, you know? So the things that uh, gripes or trouble us or, you know, are daily niggling things. You know, my, my colleague, Father Noel Connolly, he says, you know, we have to clear our mouths before our ears open. And that's true, I think, you know? So, um, <laughs> so coming together a couple of times lets us do that, you know? We, get, we clear our mouths and then we go, oh, what did you say again? <laughs> so that, that depth, I think, the, con the contemplative depths of go a little bit deeper, if you do experience this a number of times in a number of different ways with a number of different people uh, over the coming months, then the depth will come and the wisdom of the spirit and God's voice will definitely be heard. Uh, so um, that's sort of the experience itself. Do you feel like that's something you can do? Yeah? Okay. You have each other for support. So share ideas and, and let each other know, oh, I did this last week and it was really bad, or I did this last week and it was really great and we talked about blah, 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 you know? The only way that the voices that are not usually heard are going to be heard is by invitation and deliberately saying, how can we go and meet the pe those people where they're at, right? So those who do sleep rough, um, those who are housebound, elderly who are, you know, aged care bound, um, all, all of those sorts of things. Like, think about in your community, how can I go, you know? How can I print out this little piece of paper and actually go and have this conversation with someone? That's your mandate now, is that okay? All right. Now, I don't know what time it is. I think we've just got a couple of minutes. Is that right? Um, I just brought up on the screen when it comes up. Oh, so one thing is, this, what, you have cap what I've captured here, we will type. And it will become a Townsville submission with this morning's, with today's, and then with this evening's as well. Okay? So what, all of what you have shared here will, will come in. That doesn't mean you can't go and talk about it again. That's okay. Um, but we'll sort of estimate the numbers of people and, and put that in as a group submission. I just wanted to show you this. This is the upload part at the end of that online submission bit. Uh, so you can upload three files if you want to, or just one, or none, and then can just click through. Um, now, you know the download the PDF, keep a copy for yourself? That's an idea that happened by virtue of a question that somebody asked. So we've only made that possible in the last 12 hours. So it's not live yet. We're just working out the kinks, but probably by Monday that'll be ready, okay? And then you just click, and, that's, and it's finished, that's it. So then it just kicks you back to the website. 